I've entitled my sermonette this morning, Remember. Three sisters aged 92, 94 and 96 lived together in the same house. One night the 96-year-old draws a bath. She puts one foot in the bath and pauses. She yells down the stairs. Was I getting in the bath or out of the bath? The 94-year-old yells back. I don't know. I'll come up and see. She starts up the stairs, gets halfway up and pauses. Then she yells out, Was I going up the stairs or down the stairs? The 92-year-old sitting at the kitchen table and listening shakes her head and says, I sure hope I never get that forgetful. She knocks on wood just for good measure. Then she replies, I'll come up and help both of you just as I see who knocked at the door. It's an amusing anecdote, but it's highly possible as age increases because most of us have overactive forgetters and our rememberers are anemic and we need reminders. I remember one of my friend's mothers used to put a piece of string around her finger to remind her of things. And I also remember she forgot what the piece of string was there for one day. We may ask someone to remind us. We may put it on a calendar. We may write notes for ourselves. Forgetfulness can start at any age. I admire Tucker's ability to recall Bible verses and texts, and I have earnestly tried to commit verses to memory, and it may stick for a while, but it doesn't seem to stick for forever. So I now rely on the Holy Spirit to provide it when it's required. I could once remember all the jobs and details associated with them in my work and often remember details and names years later when asked. But as times progress, those abilities have slowed or slowly gone completely, especially now I don't have to remember them. Remembering has been a requirement and a tradition since God made man. The first thing we needed to remember was a day of rest, the seventh day. Then they needed to remember God's conversations and covenants with man. And they had to pass them down from generation to generation. Luckily, we now have the Bible in written form to acquire that knowledge. But as Tucker said, we need to read it ourselves and study it to make sure that what we acquire is truth. Memories are precious. They keep us connected to people, to places, to events that have shaped and influenced our lives. We may wish we could forget some things, but even life's unpleasantries can offer lasting lessons learned through adversity. Remember the past so we don't repeat mistakes in the future, something the world seems to keep doing. At the Last Supper, Jesus shared a meal with his disciples and then led them in the ancient observance of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, or Passover. Jesus, the Master Teacher, used this opportunity to plant an important memory in his disciples gathered in that upper room. Jesus shared this meal for their benefit and for ours. As Jesus raised the bread and the cup in thanksgiving, he added new significance to this ancient ritual. Luke 22 records that Jesus told his disciples to observe the Passover in remembrance of me. Jesus took an old symbol and filled it with new meaning. The meaning of Jesus' words and actions is rooted in his command to remember. As today's disciples, we observe the Lord's Supper in remembrance of Christ. Some congregations refer to this ordinance as the Memorial Supper to highlight the significance of Christ's atoning work on the cross and to call believers to remember his sacrificial death. 
Others call it communion, to highlight the believer's intimacy with Christ. Whatever we call this observance, one thing is clear, it is time to remember. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is the historical background for the establishment of the Lord's Supper. Exodus 12 presents the final chapter in God's miraculous rescue of Israel from slavery in Egypt, the plague of judgment of the firstborn. For the angel of death to pass over a household, a family had to put blood from a sacrificed lamb on the doorframe of their house and eat the Passover meal as the Lord had prescribed. This lamb and the meal of unleavened bread became the abiding symbol of Israel's deliverance from bondage. As Jesus' disciple watched Jesus and listened to his words this Passover, they would have understood the historical significance of his actions. What they did not fully understand until after the crucifixion and resurrection was the transformation of what had been a Jewish feast of remembrance into a new symbol for remembering Jesus' atoning sacrifice. The other aspect of the Lord's Supper was Jesus washing the disciples' feet as a servant. He taught us to think of others and to serve them. The act of fush washing has to us a symbolic meaning because its necessity from a practical point of view is different as we now wear shoes and socks and drive here in a car. We don't walk here in open footwear on dirty and dusty tracks and roads, which is why the feet were washed for hygiene purposes and comfort to go indoors. It symbolised humbleness and willingness to serve, to give, and not to want or receive, to put others before ourselves, to surrender to Christ and to not try and do it alone. The God who acted in history to deliver his people Israel has also acted in history to deliver us. The elements used in the supper are not the real body and blood of Jesus, but are powerful symbols that cause us to remember that Jesus really did suffer and die in a real historical time and place. What Jesus did centuries ago impacts our lives today and our eternity as well. We should remember the supper's redemptive significance. When John the Baptist saw Jesus approaching, he cried out, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John clearly established the reason for Jesus' coming as the fulfilment of what the Passover lamb had only foreshadowed. In Exodus 12, the lamb was sacrificed for the deliverance of one family. At the cross, the Lamb of God was sacrificed to deliver the whole world from the power and penalty of sin. The Passover lamb served as a substitute for the firstborn of Israel. But Jesus was our substitute at Calvary. Without the death of the lamb and the spreading of its blood, the children of Israel would have suffered the judgment of God. Without the shedding of the blood of Jesus and his substitutionary death, we would have no hope of salvation. In his book, The Tale of the Tardy Ox Cart, Charles Swindoll relates the story of an eight-year-old Kenyan girl, Monica, who fell into a pit and broke her lead. Mama Ninjuri, an older woman, seeing what had happened, climbed into the pit to rescue Mona, Monica. In the pit, a black member, the most poisonous snake in Africa, bit both Monica and Mama Ninjura. Both ladies were rushed to a medical centre. Monica improved, but tragically, Mama Ninjura died. A nurse missionary explained to Monica that Mama Ninjura was first bitten and thus received all of the member's poison. When the snake bit Monica, it had no poison left. The nurse went on to explain that Jesus had similarly taken the poison of our sin so that we can live. 
Monica understood and readily received Christ. People have many ideas about who Jesus is and why he came to earth. Jesus said himself that he came to seek and save what was lost. When we gather around the Lord's table, the elements speak to us of a sacrifice, his substitution and our salvation. We celebrate our redemption in remembrance of him. The Lord's Supper presents a powerful message of the gospel. What a perfect time to give people an opportunity to receive the salvation purchased at the cross. Those who respond will remember that the symbols of the Lord's table spoke to them of their need and Christ's provision. We should remember the supper's personal significance. Luke 22, 19 to 20 record Jesus' words, This is my body given for you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Jesus personalises his statement by using the pronoun you. Jesus told his disciples that he was going to suffer for them. He was going to die for them. True, Jesus would die for everyone, for the sin of the world. But his disciples, disciples heard him, Jesus say, I am doing this for you. If you're like me, you receive a lot more junk mail than any other kind of mail in your letterbox. You know the kind of mail I'm talking about. It's addressed to an occupant or a resident, and if the envelope does have your name on it, it's usually in a computer-generated label that may or may not have your name spelled correctly. In short, it's not personal. If, however, you get a piece of mail with your name handwritten or typed, and you recognise the return address, then you know it's from someone who has written to you personally. People generally open that kind of mail first, and it is almost always a source of pleasure. Personal mail shows that someone has taken time to communicate with just you. In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul gives instruction concerning the Lord's Supper, and in doing so reminds the Corinthian Christians of two things, their personal salvation in Christ and that participation in the supper carries inward and outward aspects. Inwardly, participants are to examine themselves spiritually before taking the supper. Outwardly, participants proclaim through the supper the Lord's death until he returns. Observing the Lord's Supper carries personal significance because Jesus calls us to remember that he gave his body for you. It also carries personal responsibility for us to participate with reverence, humility and in sincerity. Understanding and proclaiming Christ's great act of love. Paul said that our observance of the Lord's Supper is to be done to help us to remember Christ. Perhaps we are never more the church, the bride of Christ, than when we gather at the table today to worship by remembering him. May we never forget. <laughs>